Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. This is a pop up surprise session of Sustain What, my Columbia Climate School uh, project uh, seeking progress where complexity and consequence collide. But sometimes I divert into personal explorations and questions uh, and journeys. And uh, Kimo Gori has been on quite a journey uh, from uh, one of the leading pioneers in sustainability communication and, um, and development, just trying to get things moving to uh, a peripatetic uh, world roaming bicyclist uh, with, with a, uh, again, a passion for sustainability who had a really rough ride on a recent journey in, uh, I think it was in Alaska, and now has found his way onto a sailboat in the Persian Gulf, actually sort of replicating a journey I did in 1984 when I I had been, um, I spent 18 months on a sailboat sailing from New Zealand to Europe back in 1978 through 80. Uh, and the skipper of that trip, Lon Bubeck, called me one day saying he was planning to go to Abu Dhabi to deliver a sailboat to the Maldives. And he said, you want to come? And actually, I was at Science Digest writing about, um, I'd just written a big story on nuclear winter, the idea that the planet could freeze in a nuclear war. That piece was in the can, and uh, and and I uh, said, hey, I'm coming. I actually, I had to quit my job to do it. But So and so I was just fascinated to hear you're uh, now uh, getting ready to move from, take a boat from the Persian Gulf uh, out toward uh, Maldives and uh, so I just said, let's do this. And let me uh, change screen so we can uh, meet uh, you and the skipper, Mark, uh, uh, on the Jean-Marie in, is it Abu Dhabi or are you in Dubai? Where, where are you right now? Oh, hold, hold on one second. I, okay, so we're, just introduce your, yourselves and uh, then we'll get into the, the meat and mashed potatoes. Sure, sure. Just real briefly. I've been based here in Abu Dhabi for the last 17 years. <clears throat> um, originally from uh, San Diego, California, or grew, grew up in Malawi in uh, Africa. But uh, San Diego has uh, been kind of the, the home, home base. Uh, but based here for the last 17 years, and I work in um, essentially using geographic information system technology to support urban and regional planning. And we've been, you know, doing that pretty much all over the world. I'm kind of, I'm semi-retired now, sort of a uh, an extraction, self-extraction strategy over the next four years and turning things over to our senior senior staff. Well, there's a lot of urban development happening, happening right around you there. Uh, when, I was oh, in, yeah. when I was in Abu Dhabi in 1984, it was basically two-story buildings at most. Yeah. Uh, that, that whole area, Dubai, and maybe there, there might have been a couple of things taller than that. It was a dusty backwater. And to think, I, I haven't been back Absolutely. since, so I just I look at the pictures and the satellite images and I can't imagine what it's like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a change place. I, I first came here in 1991, first project that we did here, working for the National Oil Company doing uh, oil uh, spill contingency planning, doing the environmental analysis for that. And uh, yeah, it's uh, been amazing. Back then they talked about tourism and you kind of looked around and said, hmm, okay. <laughs> and uh yeah it's 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 definitely changed wow and 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 uh chemo for those who don't you know you just give a thumbnail sure uh, hi i'm chemo gory and uh, chemo's a hawaiian name from the islands grew up in california old berkeley hippie from the 60s and uh my first act was as a stand-up comedian professional clown uh went through school got into the united nations and spent uh 27 years publishing that's where we had overlapped andy um yeah. running a team doing um reporting on sustainable development and multilateral negotiations and during the pandemic i thought you know i think i'm gonna get out and muck around in the environment a little bit more um and uh was writing the third act during that intermission um and i've been cycling pretty much full-time uh, since the end of the pandemic rode from Minnesota up to Alaska and came back and was guiding uh, bicycle tours in the Yukon and scouting a route all the way up to the uh, to Toyokutuk on the uh, Bering Sea, um, the Beaufort Sea, Arctic Sea, and 
Um, now, on the uh, Jean Marie heading off to the Maldives and uh, doing a little uh, writing along the way. So, uh, uh, Mark, tell us about the Jean Marie. Yeah, the well, Jean Marie has interesting history. It was actually built in France. And um, the fellow that uh, had it built uh, decided he didn't like sailing after the first year. And the guy that I bought it from, he, uh, he, he purchased it at that time. And he was a Swiss, uh, Swiss national who had immigrated to South Africa. And uh, he's got a whole interesting story. He was a shipwright, so it, it was, uh, he really maintained it uh, nicely. Uh, he, when he turned 72 about four years ago, uh, he, uh, he was diagnosed with uh, cancer and uh, he was able to, you know, overcome that. But he and his wife decided to retire back in Fort Elizabeth in South Africa. And so I bought it from them. Uh, they were in Langkawi, Malaysia at the time. So I flew there, had a surveyor to you know, take a look at it. It had everything that I was looking for. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a blue water cruiser and it was outfitted with everything, you know, you need to basically stay off grid for extended periods. And uh, so I've been upgrading some things since then, but um, it's a really um, a, a very uh, seaworthy blue water craft and uh, looking forward to getting out there. Um, it's been sitting here in Abu Dhabi doing day sales and weekend sales for the last three years, and I've been living on it. Um, so able to kind of troubleshoot a lot of stuff, but <clears throat> you, know, you know, stuff uh, come, comes out of the woodwork once you really get offshore. So we're, we're looking forward to getting the heck out of this uh, Port Zion <laughs> where wow. we're, we've been stuck for a couple of days. Now I've got to show this. Uh, let's see. I've got it set up here. Let me see if we can find it. You have some kind of technologies that are something that blows my mind. Oh, here we go. So, so I, you know, in when I was on the Wanderlust in 1979 to eight through to 80 and on in 1984, we basically, you know, we, we had sextant. <laughs> you had, you had real looking? intelligence rather than artificial No, no, no. Intelligence. But yeah. what are we looking at? So what are we looking at here? Well, what this is, is this? this is called Predict Wind. It is a Kiwi-based organization that takes the information from various um, weather models and using AI and the characteristics of the boat projects where will be the best route to pick up the best wind at the best time. And these are four different departure times spaced 12 hours apart. And it shows that even though we're sitting here in the harbor, we are actually not going to lose much time because when we get up and through the Straits of Hormuz, we're going to be picking up those northerlies that you see on screen mm -hmm. hitting right about now that'll blow us all the way down the coast of Oman. Didn't have that on board when you were out there in 84, huh, Andy? <laughs> no, no. Well, I sent you guys a, uh, a PDF of this goofy, comical satire story I wrote based loosely on that trip where Lon Bubeck was on the, uh, I think there's a picture of him with the sextant taking readings. And we also faced some other things. Uh, you know, 1984, uh, the Persian Gulf was in the middle of... Um, conflict, the northern end, around in Iraq, and uh, we ran into some uh, several cra naval craft on the way through. Um, is that situation a little less tense now? I mean, obviously, there's it's a region that's rife with... Uh, yeah, we, you pressure. know, every, every day or two, um, we, we get security notices uh, from uh, U.S. Uh, requesting that anybody see suspicious, quote-unquote, suspicious activity. Uh, report it, um, but um, it, it's uh, there's there's no immediate conflicts. There's there's things that flare up occasionally, but uh, we we want to sort of avoid the um, the Iranian territory up there and get down into the Omani waters as quickly as possible. And you said uh, I can't remember. Did you say you have done uh, sort of sea passages before? Uh, I've done sea passages mainly off of uh, California. Nothing nothing uh, crossing a whole ocean. Uh, so this will be the longest uh, passage that, that I've done. I've been, you know, sailing off and on for 30 years, but, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, weekend, one week, two week uh, things at a time. So this will be the, the longest that, that I've done. 
that's fantastic. I, I, you're gonna, it's they're so memorable. I on the Wanderlust, we sailed that was the 1979 1980. Uh, well, we as I said, we sailed uh, from New Zealand to Europe, but the passage across the Indian Ocean was uh, the most memorable in many ways. Um, uh, it was 21 days from actually from Maldives west to Djibouti, uh, sailing on this kind of clunky cutter uh, made maybe five or six knots, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. eight, maybe in a real gale. And and then in 1984 on the Rashika, sailing from uh, your where you are to Maldives, we ran into things like this water spout. We, you know, that was not, mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was also very unnerving. But, uh, you know, a water spot like that probably wouldn't be too terrible as long as you have the sails down. But it's amazing stretches of water, the, the deep ocean there. One of the things that happened to me in that stretch was, and we again, we had no autopilot, so someone had to be on watch 24 hours a day. Um, um, but like two in the morning, we were sailing west, and the, the, uh, the, the uh, steering station was in the stern, right way in the back. And um, I was kind of half asleep and I heard this suddenly whoosh, like this huge breath. And it was a whale at surface near us. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, those are such unforgettable experiences. We went swimming in the middle of that, with the Indian Ocean, uh, stopping. Did, you, know, find your, did you find your sustainability roots during those years? Absolutely. It was that I wasn't a journalist yet. I was 22 year old, you know kid i just happened to end up on this boat and uh of all the sustainable transport systems the bicycle the uh sailboat are two perfectly unfiltered ways to experience the natural environment and get around the world i don't think that there's a finer way to travel than by two wheels or several sails yeah you know and i'm gonna have to introduce you at some point to uh Carl Copeland and Robin Bell. I'm just showing you, they were on this show. Uh, when was it last fall? They're sailing around the world. She's a glaciologist who spent many seasons uh, in Antarctica. And mm -hmm. Carl was an environmental lawyer at Pace University for a long time. And they, he's retired. She's taking a sabbatical. And let me see if I can get to the point where you can see their boat. Um, Oh, well, here, you know, they're doing the same thing. Carl wrote a book on uh, living a low-carbon life. Uh, he bicycles mm. uh, passionately. They live in the Hudson Valley, and um, and they're on this journey like you guys. They're right now in um, Australia, I'm pretty sure, mm. uh, by making their slow way around. Uh, it's very exciting. You know, it, and I'm glad you're communicating it, uh, uh, Kimo, because... You know, these are things that most people can never do, right? Some people can go on a cruise ship. Maybe if you know, a lot of middle class people can get to sea in some way or other, but there's something really unique about this kind of process. So sharing that, you know, is it's just great that you're doing that, and good luck with it going forward. Um, I didn't ask you uh, what happens when you get to Maldives, Mark. <clears throat> well, we've um, we've got a month that we'll be tooling around, uh, mainly in northern Maldives, and then we're joining a rally uh, that's been put on by the uh, the the, the uh, uh, it's the Authority for Tourism Development in Maldives, and what they're trying to do is introduce um, a bit more um, access and exposure to the rural communities outside these kind of mega you know mega right. um, resort areas and uh, get some more cultural appreciation etc they had seven boats uh, last year that was which was the first rally and this year it looks like they're gonna have at least double that and uh, so we're, we're looking forward to joining that then we're gonna after that we have kind of changes of crew and we'll head south and um, I've got a buddy of mine who's uh, I've been a surfer since I was 13 and so we've got uh, a friend that runs uh, surf camps in Bali and in Sri Lanka he's gonna join and we'll hit uh, a couple of weeks of surf in South Sri Lanka. Then a Sri Lankan friend is joining, and then we'll sail to uh, southern Sri Lanka from there. Oh, that's so great. Um, we, we went to Sri Lanka, too, before Maldives on the Wanderlust. And, um, 
it's a country. We were there just before the Civil War. We mm. arrived in Trincomalee, up in the northeast part of uh, mm -hmm. Sri, Sri Lanka, and it was already you could see tensions rising. And mm. so many parts of the world that I visited on that trip at that time are really hard to visit now. The Maldives. It's great yeah. to hear what you were saying about the rural areas in the Maldives because when we sailed there in, in, on the Wanderlust in 1980 we uh, touched on a couple of the Northern islands and we kind of thought we could just hang out, you know, just go there, anchor and go ashore. But and this is a picture I took uh, at down that trip. It's an incredible area. Mm. Uh, people mm. beautiful. But they had a walkie talkie and they could talk to the next island and the, uh, each island mm. was connected. They sent a message down to uh, Malay, the capital and, they said, you have to come down here and check in. <laughs> but that's like a thousand miles. <laughs> well, it was yeah, hundreds yeah. of miles. Anyway. And, yeah, and yeah. so we, we, had to, uh, we had to leave after just a couple of days. But when I went back on the Rashika in 1984, we were in, in Malé and uh, that area. So, but the rural areas, really they, like need, they need the development. System. Well, and they need sustainable development. And the current right. model, high input, um, high income tourism. They don't open those resorts to us yachties, but they've now changed their laws in the Maldives to allow greater access for cruising vessels. This is an example of ecosystem services, improving the natural environment or, in, in, or access the natural environment without destroying it. So Rather than having yachties sailing through the Maldives and not stopping, by promoting sustainable island tourism and cruising in the area, we're able to stop in, visit small islands, moor off of uh, local communities, and spend dollars, marks, or the local currency uh, in hotels and restaurants, which then promotes sustainable development throughout the region and empowers uh, local community economies. That's, I think that's great. Um, and finding that balance is um, always a challenge. Everything is changing all the time. Uh, oh, the other thing that was new, when, um, when we arrived in Maldives in 1980, on the Wanderlust, I think that was the first. They had just gotten their first international flight on that. They had expanded the runway oh, yeah. at the airport. And I remember seeing there was a guy out there with a broom sweeping, <laughs> off, sweeping off the coral, you know, any kind of stray coral rubble from the, air, the, uh, the landing strip. And it's a place that has a huge tourism flow by aircraft from Europe. Um, yeah. That uh, probably was blunted during the pandemic, but certainly... Uh, a big deal. So the idea of more lower impact ways to be there would be really, really cool. Uh, what, so what's your idea? So you head out when? Like tomorrow? Or well, <laughs> we, yeah, you know, like usual is there's the last uh, check the box kind of bureaucracies that we're walking through. And so I had to deregister the boat here and re-register it in the States. And there's all kinds of uh, hoops that we've got to jump through for customs and immigration. So hopefully we'll get things resolved with our agent in the U.S. tonight, and uh, we hope to set off tomorrow. And uh, a place where people can keep track, again, I think, if I got this correct, is uh, let me just share the page. Well, certainly um, on Facebook, uh, Kimo, you're, you're, you're posting yeah, a lot. But I'll be posting not on this page, but my public page, which is called the Rise Up Ride. Oh, and that's on Facebook. And, yeah, that's a that's a, this is my private page, but the public page is the Rise Up Ride, and I have it configured so that using my Garmin InReach satellite transponder, I'll be able to post short messages each day and our location at sea, and uh, that way. Folks can follow there us as we do the transit. Great. There it is. Um, the rise yeah. of the ride. Well, that's great. And by the way, Kimo, could you just, in a few minutes, just explain, uh, you, you're starting to draft a piece that you're going to be posting shortly, but tell just a brief sketch of the accident that happened on the bike and um, 
you know, how you keep pushing forward. One thing I, I'm so impressed with in your life, uh, you know, anytime I think I'm persistent or energetic, I look at someone like you and I go, I got work to do. <laughs> so what, what, what's happened, you know, the last couple of years that, that, that took you to this moment? Well, I had been uh, guiding bicycle tours out of Haines, Alaska, for a wonderful organization called Sockeye Cycle. And um, uh, between bicycle tours last summertime, I thought that it'd be great to scout a new route from the Pacific Ocean at Skagway to the Arctic Ocean. Uh, carrying all of my gear, camping out all the way up the Klondike Highway from over White Pass into Whitehorse, up to Dawson City, and then um, up to Tuktoyuktuk on the Beaufort Sea above the Arctic Circle. And I was on my way back um, after unsuccessfully riding the Dempster Highway. Uh, there was some mud called uh, gumbo mud that I got stuck in, but that's another story. I was in the middle of nowhere and somehow in the middle of nowhere, car cross uh, Yukon and I picked up the coronavirus, which hit me while I was descending a 3000 foot mountain pass uh, across the border from Northern British Columbia into Skagway. I was four kilometers from home when the virus hit my inner ear and I crashed the bike and broke two ribs. Okay. Um, and so I took uh, Alaska seaplanes through Juneau back home and sat in my easy chair with COVID and busted ribs, um, trying to get uh, healthy enough to do this new adventure. Um, so I, I just like to get out there and muck around in the environment after having spent, as you know, many years uh, in windowless negotiating rooms, <laughs> negotiating the biodiversity conventions and the climate accords and stuff like that. So now I'm taking advantage of all that work and getting my feet hands dirty again. And, and is it correct that there was a crew wanted sign that led you to this, Mark? <laughs> Mark? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I was looking for... Um, you know, friends and family, I joined a couple of different associations for finding crew, <coughs> crew, and I figured, well, I, I, I should toss out a message to friends and family first and see, you know, if, if people that I already know would be uh, interested. And uh, I posted it, and Timo responded within one hour of that post. So here we are. <laughs> That's amazing. Lucky me. <laughs> it, my, my 1978. 79 journey started with a crew wanted sign. I was uh, in the South Pacific after college uh, on a fellowship. I had gotten to do some research and in New Zealand, in Auckland, I was wandering the docks. I grew up in Rhode Island sailing, but never across an ocean. And there was a sign on a bulletin board that said, crew wanted, yacht wanderlust, heading to Mediterranean, inquire Marsden Wharf. And uh, it tugged at me, and I went and met, met Lon Bubeck, the skipper. They were changing crew after this boat had made its way from California to New Zealand. And when I talk to young people these days, um, wherever they are, in whatever circumstance they are, you know, I say, if you have some moment when you can divert from your standard track, something tugs at you, try to see if there's a way to follow that tug. Uh, this can be, you know, wherever you are, whatever stage or level of life you are, um, because unexpected things can happen. And that changed, certainly changed my life. I, I don't think I would have ended up in journalism if I hadn't been on the wanderlust and seen that big chunk of the world and wanted to tell the story, you know, to share what I was seeing. So I'm glad uh, in your third act, to use Bill, Bill McKibben's term, uh, Kimo, you're you're finding a way to uh, not only uh, stretch your 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 own horizons, but to uh, share them through social media. I showed your your Instagram page and uh, your what you're doing on Facebook with uh, the Rise Up Ride. It's great to meet you both, and you know maybe we can check in again uh, from Maldives when you have signal, and uh, or wherever you know, when you're truly done, uh, or Kimo when you're back on 
uh, dry land. That, that sounds great. And, and by the way, uh, as opposed to your uh, walkie-talkies between islands, apparently there's pretty much ubiquitous 4G available across most of the islands. So it's a, a different story, I think. Well, it's, it's an evolving story. You know, that's what's so yeah. cool about the world right now. Um, connectedness offers a uh, huge potential for um, uh, making people, a, you know, a community, a global community. We, back in the 60s, that seemed like some kind of goofy idea. And, uh, but also direct experience, getting out in the world, whether it's uh, yeah. down the block in uh, a community with less privilege or if it's uh, around the world, if you get the chance. Uh, those direct experiences are precious and really do make the world a better place too. Thanks, thanks for joining me. This was a total spontaneous uh, combustion event. Those are the best. <laughs> yeah, and and best you know, sail uh, best wishes on the journey. Uh, uh, keep watch. There's a lot of shipping um, to keep track of, and there are wonders like the whales that surfaced at two in the morning, and uh, and I look forward to checking in with you again. Uh, Mark, what's your last name again? Sorensen, Danish so version Mark, with Ian. Yeah. Mark Sorensen yep. and Kimo Gori on the Jean Marie, getting ready to depart from. Uh, the uh, Emirates and the Persian Gulf and head through the Strait of Hormuz uh, south uh, along the coast of Oman, which we also visited, and off to um, Maldives, the Republic of Maldives, to uh, further of adventures. This is Andy Revkin, Columbia Climate School, Sustain What webcast, pop-up version. Uh, everyone have a happy, healthy, uh, fruitful 2023, and stretch your boundaries once in a while. And let me know what you're up to. Um, the, that little scrolling bar at the bottom is a way to get in touch with me. Um, maybe I can do a webcast with those who are someone who's watching, who's doing something special as well. Take care. Good night to you over in See you, uh, Andy. the Gulf Thanks, and Andy. Farewell. farewell. Ahoy. Take care.